to kick off today's speakers, I'd like to introduce Rick Sturdivant. Rick W. Sturdivant joined the U.S. Air Force History and Museums Program in 1984 and became Deputy, Deputy Director of History for Air Force Space Command in 1999, United States Space Force in 2019, and Space Operations Command since 2020. He serves on the editorial board of Quest, the History of Space Flight Quarterly, and is editor of the International Academy of Astronautics History Series. Rick's professional honors include the Air Force Exemplary Civil Civilian Service Award, 1995 to 1999, the American Astronautical Society's President's Recognition Award in 2005, and election as an American Astronautical Society Fellow in 2007. Rick is a previous Regional History Symposium presenter and an author. So please join me in welcoming him as he presents Air and Space Forces in Colorado Springs, their bases and memorable characters. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And I, I, it's my privilege to be with you all this morning. Uh, the reason that I picked the title that I did for this presentation is that without talking about air and space bases, it wouldn't make much sense to talk about the memorable characters. But what I really want to focus on are the people associated with air and space, uh, military air and space in Colorado Springs. And since this is a sesquicentennial presentation, next slide, please. Uh, the first non-permanent presence of the military in Colorado Springs was at the top of Pikes Peak, of course, as most of you know. In 1873, the Army Signal Corps Weather Service uh, built a weather station up there, and that lasted about 15 years or so. And uh, the people of Colorado Springs were generous enough to provide money for a 17-mile telegraph line from the top of the peaks uh, down to uh, the present uh, uh, town location. Uh, but that, that didn't last very long. The first real persistent presence came with World War II and air power. Next slide, please, Kara. Uh, and the person primarily responsible for that, there were many boosters in Colorado Springs, but the person primarily responsible was Charles Leeming Tut, Jr. You see him in the upper picture there. Uh, the Army had been looking at places around Colorado Springs, uh, possibly for an Army training base in the late 1930s, but they didn't think the environment was quite right uh, for training uh, Army uh, personnel. Uh, and Tut took it upon himself as a booster, developer, and banker that he was uh, to wine and dine some of these people at the Broadmoor and convince them uh, to set up a, an army post uh, in uh, 19, early 1942. Uh, and uh, so that happened in February of 42, Camp Carson uh, came about. And uh, immediately people recognized and the army recognized it needed an air support base. And uh, so uh, Colorado Springs had an airport. They'd been extending the runway since 1937 so that it could accommodate uh, large heavy aircraft like, uh, like bombers. And uh, one of the contractors who had contracted with uh, four or five other companies to build Camp Carson was Ed Honan. You see him in the bottom picture there. Uh, Ed Honan uh, was a dirt mover basically and his construction company did, did a lot of dirt moving. Uh, he was working on Camp Carson, and at the same time, he convinced a couple of other contract companies uh, to go in with him uh, to begin to lay out uh, what became Colorado Springs Army Air Base in May of 1942. Uh, Honan, you see him in uniform. He later, after he finished uh, building uh, uh, the, uh, the Air, uh, Air Base, Army Air Base here, uh, he went and became a Naval Seabee, and uh, he did great things. Uh, after the Normandy invasion of D-Day, uh, there was a massive storm and between the wreckage from D-Day and that storm, uh, Patton's tanks couldn't get onto the continent. And so it was Ed Honan who led the effort in just a matter of days to clear the Normandy beach so that uh, Patton could, uh, and his third army could land their tanks. Next slide, please. So then we come to Colorado Springs Army Air Base. And Major Elliot Roosevelt, one of Franklin Roosevelt's sons, you see him in the upper left there, uh, he was assigned as commander of the Third Photo Reconnaissance Group, which formed in mid-July of 42. Uh, the base hadn't, hadn't actually been com completely constructed yet. And, uh, but he came here 
He lived up at the Broadmoor, uh, just across the street from the front entrance today at First and Elm. And he uh, liked to golf, even though he had a bad, uh, bad knee from surgery. He golfed quite often at the golf course there at the Broadmoor. But he didn't stay very long. By mid-September, the third photographic group that he commanded was on its way to England, and then shortly thereafter to North Africa. And, uh, and uh, so he did come back a year later, however, to, uh, to uh, do a study of how well the photo reconnaissance training was going. He didn't think it was going very well, as a matter of fact, in that report. And I talk about that in the paper at more length. You see in the lower right there, the unit's uh, emblem if you want to translate the Latin, it means shoot well, uh, not with guns, but obviously with photographs. Next slide. Next, thank you. Um, one of the uh, enlisted people who went over to uh, England and North Africa with Roosevelt was the man on the left. His name was Wallace Rayburn Gates, and uh, Sergeant Gates was my mother's uh, oldest brother. Uh, he had come to Colorado uh, from uh, California, where he had done photo reconnaissance uh, work as well, uh, in April of 1942 as part of what was called the Photographic Reconnaissance Operational Training Unit, or PRO-2. Uh, and their job was to establish the Army Air Base. Most of these men, and, and Wally was married, so he and his wife rented a house uh, in uh, near downtown Colorado Springs, but uh, all of their work was going on in various uh, rented facilities, leased facilities in the downtown Colorado Springs area because uh, they, they were still building the base. But he helped lay out what uh, doesn't exist anymore, it was called the Star Building, which is where they would process the photographs taken by reconnaissance trainees and move them toward a central area in the building uh, where they would paste together maps. Uh, and it was interesting uh, I found this photo on the right. That's Wally Gates uh, in North Africa in 1943. He's bent over and is pasting a series of photographs uh, to make a, uh, a photo map for intelligence planning purposes in North Africa. Uh, I'd never seen that photograph until I started doing research for this project. But it shows exactly what they were training here in Colorado Springs to do in combat. Next slide, please. On the 13th of December, 1942, Colorado Springs Army Air Base was re renamed Peterson Field. It was after Lieutenant Edward J. Peterson, as most of you know. He was a P-38 pilot, or actually the photo reconnaissance planes were called F-4s, but they were, they were P-38s. Uh, he was killed on takeoff on the 8th of August in 42. And so the, the name has persisted. It's Peterson Space Force Base today. Next slide, please. Many other interesting uh, pilots and, uh, and technicians came through uh, Peterson uh, Field, and one of them you see on the left here was Richard Sully Leghorn. He was the squadron leader for the photo reconnaissance squadron that went over the Nazi fortifications at Normandy before the D-Day invasion and plotted out and photographed all of the German uh, um, fortifications there uh, so that uh, when the paratroopers landed, they, some, of their, some of their targets were some of those bases that Richard Sully Leghorn uh, had photographed. He later pioneered reconnaissance from outer space. On the right, you see one of the Corona or Discoverer cameras from the late 1950s through the 1970s that his ITEC Corporation uh, built for the US military and the CIA. Next slide, please. In June of 1943, there was a decision to bring uh, more Air Force personnel, Army Air Force personnel to Colorado Springs. And that was the second Air Force. Uh, it was a centralized location for their mission, which was defense of the Western United States. And pending construction of the facilities for the Second Air Force, they occupied the old National uh, Methodist Sanitarium, sanitarium uh, for TB that had been built in 1926. That was their headquarters. And next to that sprang up, as you see in the lower picture there, uh, the Colorado Springs tent camp. Brigadier General Uzel Ent 
had originally been the chief of staff for the second air force and in 1944 he became the commander and was already famous for leading the uh, uh, raid on the oil refineries at Ploesti, Romania uh, in August of 1943, a very, very dangerous uh, but successful mission. His primary mission in Colorado Springs, however, was training heavy and very heavy bomber groups who were uh, flying the new Boeing B-29 super fortresses. They were then in training at Grand Island, Nebraska for the most part. So you see Ant there on the right. Next slide, please. <clears throat> on 1 September of 1944, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts came to town. Uh, Uzel Ent had summoned him to Second Air Force headquarters, which you see there on the left, that's the old sanatorium building. Uh, Tibbetts is the uh, individual in the uh, top center there. Uh, he was 29 years old and Ent had a special mission for him. Ent uh, explained to him about the successful ex atomic explosions that were happening down in New Mexico. And uh, he offered Tibbetts the mission of dropping the first atomic bomb. That happened here in Colorado Springs. And uh, Tibbetts later selected the man at the bottom center, Charles Sweeney, Chuck Sweeney, to pilot uh, the second aircraft to drop the second bomb on Nagasaki. Uh, in August of 1945. There you see on the right there, respective airplanes. Next slide, please. Co-piloting B-29s with both Tibbetts and Sweeney was a woman Air Force Service pilots member, Lieutenant Mary Helen Gosman, you see her there. And uh, she was one of only six WASPs women pilots that Tibbetts trained at Grand Island to fly the B-29. He gave each of them three days of training. That He wanted to use women pilots because all the male pilots were saying the B-29 was too difficult a plane to fly and they were afraid to fly it. And so he trained these women to do that. Uh, she uh, had one famous story that she told about co-piloting a flight with him when uh, one of the male members uh, on the crew uh, showed her a girly magazine that he marked up and in, in some sort of uh, lustful way and, and gave it to her. And she was sitting in the co-pilot seat and she, with her left hand, took the magazine and slapped the guy back into the navigator's uh, area in the airplane. And she told Tibbetts, keep that guy away from me because if he's within 100 feet of me when we get off this plane, I'm going to take care of him. Uh, she never saw him again. I think Tibbetts probably got rid of that, that fellow. Both Tibbetts and Sweeney had nothing to say, but very, very positive feedback. Sweeney told a story about uh, flying in with a B-29 into Denver for some repairs, and his co-pilot uh, was Mary Gosnell. And the snowstorm came in after, and one of the things they were going to try to fix was the P-top, uh, which is, a, is an instrument that's on the airplane to give you uh, some relative sense of your airspeed. Uh, it had been acting up. When they, when they signed off, the, the repair crew signed off on it and they got ready to take off, there was a blizzard. And as they headed for takeoff and reached airspeed, uh, uh, Sweeney looked over and realized that Gosnell's uh, controls were giving a different airspeed from what his were. Well, the training manual had told him you'll cut power at that point. So he, he ordered cut power, but, uh, but Goswell hesitated just long enough and gave it full power that they managed to become airborne. And uh, because they were approaching a rise in the terrain, uh, if they had cut power, they probably would have crashed. So Sweeney in his autobiography gives her great credit uh, for, her, for her piloting skill. You see the emblem of the wasps up there in the upper right, the uh, Fifinella. And you can see it on her jacket in the lower uh, picture as well. Uh, she came here later in the 1960s and worked in Teller County and worked as a bookkeeper at the, uh, at the Broadmoor. And you can see she's buried in Evergreen Cemetery. If you'd like to visit her. Next slide, please. Another person that Gosnell flew with uh, was Brigadier General Frank Alton Armstrong. And uh, his famous aircraft, 
the fluffy fuzz B-17 is in the lower left picture. The top pictures are here at, at Peterson Field in 1944. He came from Grand Island, the uh, picture in the lower part there, to, uh, to Colorado Springs in 19, uh, November of 44. He was uh, going to take the uh, 315th bomb wing uh, to the Pacific Theater. So he put the bomb wing together here at Peterson uh, Field. And, uh, and then uh, he went on and uh, he had been famous already for flying some of the first uh, air, air uh, daylight bombing raids over Europe and over Germany. But he led the largest B-29 raid against Tokyo uh, after he'd gone, uh, gone over in the Pacific Theater with the 315th. You see the uh, 12 o'clock high movie. The primary uh, character uh, who that story is based on uh, was Brigadier General Frank Alton Armstrong. And Mary Gosnell got to go on the filming set. He invited her uh, after the war in 48, 49, when they were making the movie uh, to see what they were doing. Next slide, please. So we had Pete Field and we had uh, what became Ant Air Force Base after Uzalent uh, passed away in 1948. But in 1947, a, the, Ar the uh, Army Air Forces became the United States Air Force as a separate service. And almost immediately, uh, people started saying, well, there's going to have to be an Air Force Academy, just like there is West Point in Annapolis. And so uh, they started campaigning for that. And Colorado Springs had its share of boosters. A committee was put together with five members, and you see those members in the upper left picture. The center individual, well, one of those five, was Charles Lindbergh. And some of the other members were afraid that uh, uh, it wouldn't be a good place to train air cadets here in Colorado Springs. It would be too tricky flying along the Rampart Range. So Lindbergh brought uh, two of the other members. They rented a plane at the Pine Valley Airport, and Lindbergh flew the plane, and it was Stearman and he, uh, he pronounced uh, the condition suitable uh, for an Air Force Academy. He said it was, it was safe flying. And uh, there's a lot more to that story that you can read about in my paper. So the construction began in 1955, July for the United States Air Force Academy. And most of the concrete that went into those buildings and into those foundations was provided by Castle Concrete Company. Uh, Will, William Eskelson, who you see in the center top there, was the owner of that company. He also uh, worked for core sampling on Cheyenne Mountain later on. Next slide, please. The Air Force Academy had many illustrious faculty and graduates, and we can't talk about very many today, but we'll go through some here. On the upper right, you see Colonel Bradford Parkinson. Brad Parkinson, he was the director astronautics department early on and later he led the people who formed the global positioning system that we have today. In the lower right you see Eileen Collins. <clears throat> she taught mathematics at the academy and then flying for NASA in the space shuttle became the first woman to pilot the shuttle and later uh, to command the space shuttle. On the upper left you see Susan Helms, the first U.S. military woman to fly in space and uh, a member of the first class uh, of women uh, cadets to come to the academy. Below her, you see Gary Payton. He was the first of only two astronauts to wear the United States Air Force, <coughs> excuse me, manned space flight uh, engineer patch, the MSE patch, as well as the NASA patch. And in the center, you see General Kevin Chilton. He was the only academy graduate and astronaut to achieve uh, the four-star rank, both astronaut and four stars. Next, please. While the site selection and construction of the Air Force Academy was going on, Ent Air Force Base was growing the, and it was in response to a lot to the Cold War of the late 1940s and early 50s. You see Ent there in the uh, lower center of the picture and its layout. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, after Ent died in March 48, the base was renamed in his honor. It became headquarters for Air Defense Command in January of 1951, for Continental Air Defense Command in September of 1954, both under the leadership of General Benjamin Chidlaw. Next. <clears throat> 
And then in 1955, something interesting happened in it. It was coming up on Christmas time and Sears Roebuck had, uh, had a Christmas ad, uh, but they had the wrong phone number in that ad. And Colonel Harry Shoup, who you see in the upper center, was in charge uh, of the Continental Air Defense or CONAD uh, uh, Operations Center. And he got a phone call one day from a little girl who wanted to talk to Santa Claus. So that wrong number rang into the uh, into the ops center there, and uh, and Shoup was fascinated. And he finally talked to the girl's mother, and and uh, you know the girl was crying, and you know the whole story there. Well, anyway, after that incident, and he went and he talked to the public affairs director, Colonel Barney Oldfield. You see on the right, Barney had a illustrious past. He had been a publicist for a lot of Hollywood stars in the 1930s before World War II. He had a lot of connections there. And, uh, and some of the biggies, Elizabeth Taylor and, uh, and Cary Grant and uh, Jimmy Stewart, people like that. But he talked to Barney Oldfield and all Oldfield being a public affairs specialist said, well, I'll issue a press release. And so the press release said that Conad was tracking Santa's sleigh and, uh, and that the kids didn't have to worry. Santa would make it through because Conad would protect them against the bad guys. Well, it came Christmas Eve and Colonel Shoup had some cookies that his wife had baked and he was going to take them to the command center. And uh, he uh, couldn't get in. They wouldn't open the door for him. And it was a cipher lock door, of course. And finally, they got in. And in the lower center picture, you see what? That's the plexiglass screen. The, the, the crew was writing on the back of that, tracking all of the, uh, all of the aircraft uh, traffic. And uh, they, had, they had been trying to erase what they were been, had been drawing, which was Santa's sleigh on that plexiglass. Well, Shoup got to thinking a second and he said, ah. So he called a local radio broadcaster and he started, he and the broadcaster started telling where Santa's sleigh was. And that was in 1955. That led uh, to what, when NORAD was created in 1957 and took it over in 58 when CONAD went away, that led to NORAD Track Santa. <coughs> Next slide, please. Well, as you can see, Ent was fairly crowded and, and the command center uh, there wasn't in a very safe place, even though they built a new building to replace the one in the old Methodist hospital. So General Earl, Par Earl Partridge, who you see in the center there, he was the Air Defense Command commander at the time. In 1956, he started campaigning for an underground protected facility that would be more survivable, particularly in, a, in an atomic era. Well, as most of you know, it took almost a decade until that uh, that facility became operational in 1966. Next slide, please. And another building that was built uh, uh, just on the north side of Ent, on Willamette, uh, uh, north side of Ent Air Force Base, was the Burroughs Building, now known as the Federal Building. And you can see how it looked uh, in, in when they were first building it and how it looks today. Burroughs Corporation had that built north of Ent where they could develop and test all of the computer systems that would go into Cheyenne Mountain before Cheyenne Mountain was finished. Uh, and, and this building was designed by architect in Colorado Springs, C. Dewey King. He built a lot of other uh, major commercial, uh, designed a lot of other major commercial buildings as well. Next, please. And, uh, I don't know where we are on time, but uh, I'm going to try to move fairly rapidly because I think I'm I'm I've about expired my time. Uh, but uh, as they expanded out of Ent, which was becoming crowded, and they didn't know that Cheyenne Mountain would be finished yet. Uh, the uh, Chidlaw Building, named after Benjamin Chidlaw, was built, and uh, you see some interesting characters. Who uh, Benjamin Chidlaw is in the upper right. Jim Hill, James Hill, General Hill. Uh, and and uh, uh, in General Hardinger and Tim Long. These are all people that you'll hear about in my paper. Uh, they all uh, were at the Chidlaw building and did some very important things uh, for the uh, transition from air power to space power. Next slide, please. Uh, and then 
space operations in Colorado Springs grew even, even more powerful with the establishment of Falcon Air Force Station for the Consolidated Space Operations Center in the early 1980s. Hans Mark in the upper left was Secretary of the Air Force, and he believed the Air Force should have its own separate space shuttle program. Uh, he pushed hard uh, for the Consolidated Space Operations and the Shuttle Operations Planning Complex to be at Falcon. And, uh, and the man uh, in the lower center, a uh, young man looking, uh, Brigadier General Don Mirth, was the one who took a piece of paper and drew out the first designs for what became the CSOC. Of course, Falcon Air Force Station became a base and then became Schriever Air Force Base in 1998 in honor of Bernard Schriever, the general who is considered the father of all U.S. military space uh, today. Next and last slide, please. And a lot happened. Uh, the military space headquarters moved from the Chidlaw Building to Peterson Air Force Base in 1987. A host of visionaries between then and now have brought increasingly significant change. General Harries was the first commander of the first United States Space Command that involved Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force personnel. General Tom Warman on the lower left uh, was uh, the first non-rated Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and he was the one who planned for Air Force Space Command. And in the upper right, General Hayton, who perceived that space was no longer uh, just a uh, just a global commons, that there were bad guys out there who wanted to uh, do bad things uh, to our presence in space. And his successor, General John Raymond, who's now the Chief of Space Operations, he pushed very, very hard in 2018 and 2019 for first the recreation of United States Space Command in August of 29, 2019, and then the uh, establishment of the United States Space Force, uh, the fifth uh, separate force uh, in American history. Uh, that happened in December of 2019. So the story goes on. There's a lot more detail in, in, in my paper. And I look forward to sharing that with you uh, when the proceedings volume comes out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Um, that was substantial and you're absolutely 100% correct. I can't wait to read your paper because it feels like that was such a good story that we want to, to focus on, yet it's how, like, how do you, how do you really dive into it in 20 minutes? Um, well, with that said, we will segue to our next presenter, who is Mark James. Uh, Mark is a photographer, has been a photographer for almost 50 years and has served as a photojournalist, uh, documentarian, commercial photographer, gallery owner, curator, and landscape photographer. In 1995, Mark was awarded a residency at Rocky Mountain National Park and began his present and continuing exploration of the landscape with the pinhole camera and black and white film. Since 2017, Mark has photographed Pikes Peak and the surrounding area as an ongoing study of how the Colorado wilderness landscape may have appeared two centuries ago when his ancestor, Edwin James, explored the land. Mark exhibits his photographs in museums and it has a traveling exhibit organized by the Dubuque Museum of Art titled Remnants of the West, Edwin, Edward Curtis and Mark James. Um, in general, Mark's work is rooted in both American and photographic history. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna introduce you really quickly here, but his title of today's uh, paper is Edwin James, Pikes Peak and the American West. Take it away, Mark. And there you go. Oh, okay, everyone can hear me? Let's see. Yes, we can hear you, Mark, loud and clear. Okay, well, I, I'm, on, I'm on deck here. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, I started this about four years ago. Um, it was rather casual. I'm a photographer, and uh, so I see everything literally through, well, no, it's not a lens, it's a pinhole camera. But what started out very simple uh, has expanded way past anything I ever expected. Um, I've titled this on common ground uh, because the common ground is actually the summit of Pikes Peak. Uh, Edwin James uh, stepped on there at uh, July 14th, uh, 
1820, and we were there last year on July 14th, 2020. So, uh, so the common ground is not the ancestry as much as the, the peak, or at least that's how I see it. Um, I'll take the next slide. And by, by the way, I'm gonna move as fast as I can. There's a lot of content and I hope I don't throw people for too much of a curve because I'm gonna be kind of backwards and forwards through uh, history. Um, so originally it was gonna be a, a photographic project, uh, get it into a museum as a traveling uh, exhibit. It expanded way past anything I imagined. And so, uh, so, so as I've traveled and backpacked and gone in, uh, to places where a lot of people won't go, uh, that's why I call it the making of a timeless landscape and the pinhole help, helps me do that. I'll take the next slide. So here's the historical context. He, he was born in 1797. Uh, it was a new nation with new ideas, new science. You know, it, it was just a very new uh, thing that was occurring. Um, Louisiana Purchase, of course, 1803. Uh, various uh, uh, ex expeditions were being mounted to explore this new area, especially the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of Colorado because we're quite unique. So next slide. Uh, a little map of how things looked. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Louisiana Purchase area right in the middle. And then this map actually kind of shows more, you know, as time went on. I've outlined uh, Colorado and because uh, we are going to talk about that. So uh, let's see, next slide. So, so here he is, Dr. Edwin James. He was a surgeon, botanist, explorer, translator, author, friend to the Indian. He, and I really want to focus on this, this back part where he, he was very active and uh, confrontational. And the, the thing about Edwin is, is he was, grew up in Vermont. He attended, attended stammering a little bit, uh, Middlebury College, uh, graduated at 20 with honors in uh, botany and geology. And then he found himself on the streets trying to make, uh, make ends meet. You know, he's mostly homeless actually. Uh, in letters to his brothers, he, he complains that uh, he, he has a terrible fate awaiting him. And, uh, but, but he, he was an unassuming, as you can see in the picture, he looks pretty unassuming. And this is the only uh, likeness of him that was uh, carved on a piece of ivory. And that's missing so far as I know. But, it, but he looks pretty mild mannered. You just never had an idea what was coming. And uh, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so this is my genealogy. So he, he's my uh, uncle, five generations removed. But uh, this is how, you know, it's like a racehorse. You, you kind of have uh, the genetic material that comes down through. And uh, so that just shows how, how, uh, how we're connected. Let's see, I'll take the next slide. So we'll, we'll start on his resume. And uh, I, if I had a resume anything close to this, I'd really be impressed. But he was a, a botanist, and, and that was foremost what he enjoyed. It was a lifelong passion. Uh, one of his big friends, uh, greatest loyal friends, was uh, John Torrey. So those of you who know Torrey's Peak, that's where that came from. Aza Gray was another one, and so Gray's Peak was uh, named after another botanist. So uh, a lot of the plants and species here in Colorado were discovered by Edwin James. 140 of them were above tree line. Uh, our state flower, the blue columbine, was discovered by Edwin. Uh, also the limber pine was discovered by Edwin. And uh, if you ever want some more, uh, go to the Bear Creek Nature Center. They have a wonderful uh, guided walk and they, a lot of species that Edwin had discovered is, is there uh, along the walkway. Next slide. So, so as I mentioned, he was a friend of the Indian. Um, he was very concerned about where things were going uh, relative to the mood of the country and you know the, the march towards uh, migration. I should add that uh, the United States at that point was experiencing a lot of different problems like economics, uh, their farmlands were de depleted. 
and uh, expansion was was inevitable. And, and that's going to play into this because Edwin was passionately wanting to uh, side with the, the Indian tribes. And so, so there, there was a contest about whether we could uh, coexist or assimilate or just uh, have a permanent Indian frontier, which I'll talk about a little more. Uh, next slide. He was an environmentalist. He was passionately uh, concerned about what was going to happen as people moved um, uh, westward. A lot of the species of plants that he uh, collected, identified, you know, so many of them were new to science. He was afraid that migration would just completely obliterate uh, all of that, uh, especially the ones up on Pikes Peak. He was just afraid that uh, the move towards civilization would just simply uh, take all that away. So he, uh, he again was uh, for this cause. And as you'll see, the bison was in there also. <laughs> so, uh, next slide. Uh, he was a translator. And this is really significant because it plays into his um, defense of, of the Indian and the native population. So uh, through a guy named John, uh, yeah, John Turner, um, he, th this guy was a captive and uh, he came back to the United States after 30 years of being uh, raised with the Ojibwe. And uh, while Edwin was stationed at a, a, a military base, or fort. Uh, this guy came into the United States and Edwin learned the, the native language of Ojibwe and to preserve the language. He was afraid that, you know, if you take away the language, you take away the culture and the history. Edwin knew this and so to, to preserve the language, he translated the New Testament into Ojibwe. And the New Testament was because he, he believed that of documents out there, it was a survivable document as opposed to something that was transitory. So uh, let's see, next slide. Let's see, there we go. Um, his his uh, two volume set of the long expedition and uh, what he did with John Tanner and, and other writings and botany, um, but mostly the uh, two volume set of the official recount, account um, James Fenimore Cooper wrote The Prairie and, and actually lifted some parts of it directly from the, the account. So uh, uh, in the leather stocking series, there, you know, Last of the Mohicans, The Prairie, uh, I forget at the moment what the other one was, but uh, so, so again, Edwin was a source of inspiration. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, he was an author. He did an account of the expedition. He also did, uh, it, it was two volumes and then an atlas. And he did some illustrations in the atlas concerning the uh, uh, geology of the area, which is very interesting to take a look at. As you can see on the right are the two volumes and the atlas uh, at Colorado College. They have those originals and uh, for me it was scary to handle the originals. Um, you know, it's one of those things you, you don't want to be the one that drops it. So, uh, but, but it's impressive, really impressive to see the, uh, how fine their, their printing ability was back then. Let's see, next slide. Uh, as we, this is uh, the centerpiece, what he's most known for is uh, as an explorer. So he was on the Major Long Expedition to the far west, and I'll talk a little bit more about Major Long. Uh, on the left is the official map from the account, uh, where in detail they showed their path. And what's really interesting, you can't see it here, but you have to almost get a magnifying glass. It tells where they were um, by the day uh, or by the week. And so, so as you trace it from Council Bluffs along the Platte to the Front Range, and then they come down, he tells you where they were and where they ended up for the day. And uh, Pikes Peak was July 13, actually July 12th. Um, they had artists. This was the first expedition to, to actually have scientists and artists. Uh, so this one guy, uh, Samuel Seymour, um, he, he did the first illustration. It says James Peak, um, which is a little confusing, you know, but, but they knew it to, they, at that time, they knew it to be as the highest peak or the grand peak because Zebulon Pike, that's how his map identified it. 
So, so it's a little bit of a, a name confusion there. Let's see, uh, next slide. So, so jumping back to put it in context, you know, uh, we had the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, Pikes of 1805, of course. Um, the second expedition, this is the one 1806 where he attempted to climb Pikes Peak. And I wanna really know that I think Pikes, uh, Zebulon Pike, really they haven't, history hasn't treated them very fair. Um, I climbed Mount Rosa. I thought it was a hard mountain uh, in the summer. He tried to do it in November with waist high snow, post holing his way. And when he got to the top, he saw Pikes Peak way over to the west. And I don't blame him for just saying we've had enough. And you know, they, they were on the verge of uh, uh, hypothermia. And uh, so, so I wanna give Zebulon Pike a lot of credit. Um, Major Long, it was called the Yellowstone Expedition of 1819. It kind of fell apart and then got uh, blended into his second expedition of 1820. And that's what the one that Edwin James was on. Next slide. So a little bit about Stephen H. Long. Uh, it was a military expedition. And the reason for that is they wanted him to scope out the West to see uh, what the situation was with Indians. And they wanted to also see, um, you know, whether the, the rivers could be navigated and, and especially the lands farmed. So, uh, but, but it was coming down from, from the uh, uh, Secretary of War. Uh, it was the first scientific expedition and first to employ artists, as I uh, mentioned. Uh, what his um, orders were, I thought it was very interesting. He, he was not to be confrontational with the Indians, but he was to be, you know, kind and accommodating. And all they wanted to do at that point was to really get a sense of, of what they were looking at. So, uh, so he was, he, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. Uh, next slide. Let's see, so then we jumped to Pikes Peak. And so, so Edwin, this, this guy, unassuming guy from Vermont, you know, he joins the, the long expedition and it's a whole nother world. He's going across the de desert, um, you know, an environment that he was not familiar with at all. And, uh, but he was very excited because of the botany. Um, they ended up, they, they went across the high plains. They ended up at the front range. They hooked uh, south and skirted the, you know, Castle Rock shows up on his map. And uh, anyways, he ends up at the base of Pikes Peak. Pikes, by the way, is the mountain that sticks the furthest out to the east of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. So it's very identifiable. Um, not the highest. And here, here's the key about Pikes is that Whereas most of our backpacking and hiking and all that starts from a high pass, this hike starts from the base, which is at 7,800 feet. And if you do the math, uh, in about 12 miles, you get to the top at 14,000. So it's actually quite a bit of elevation. And presently, it is absolutely the most visited mountain in, in the United States, if not the world. Uh, next slide. Um, jumping back just a touch because the, the official account came after all this. This is the, the geology part of Edwin that came out. And as you can see, he, he put out a profile of uh, the land and how it rose up you know, across the plains and then you get to the Rocky Mountains. Um, I find it absolutely fascinating that he was able to ascertain what was going on here. Not 100% right. There's things they've discovered that that weren't quite there, and in, in, uh, in particular the elevation. But but I, I thought it was just an impressive part of work uh, that he did. Uh, next slide. And here here's where controversy really comes in. They they uh, with the the support of Major Long, they called this area the Great American Desert. And the consequences of that were, were severe. Um, back in Washington City, it was called Washington City before Washington, D.C., uh, the politicians there were outraged. And because of that, in part, they, they felt that the Major Long Expedition was an absolute failure. 
they didn't want to hear the great American desert. They wanted to hear it was a land of milk and honey and uh, fertile and farming. So when they called it the great American desert, they believe um, uh, settlement migration was set back by you know, almost three decades. So uh, next slide. And I, this is really important. So because they called it the desert and because the Rocky Mountains form a wall, like I said, there's no pass under 10,000 feet. And the idea if you're gonna mi migrate, you just couldn't be going over a high pass like that. But if you tacked to the north, you could get around Colorado. If you tacked to the south, Santa Fe Trail, you could get around it. And uh, so these were the migration trails and they tried like crazy to avoid the uh, uh, state of Colorado. And of course, in my view, Edwin and Major Long were absolutely right. It's a desert. Uh, you know, I, I live north of Wellington, almost to Cheyenne. And I can tell you it takes, you know, 30 years to grow a tree 10 feet tall. So I, I see it as a, a desert. <laughs> But uh, next slide. Um, he ended up as, uh, towards the end of his life, he ended up as an abolitionist. His homestead in Burlington, Iowa uh, was a station. And, and you can, in the center photo, you, you get a sense of how they did that, uh, how they hid the, the, uh, the slaves coming across the Mississippi. Um, the photo on the left, I went to the site, to his homestead, what's left to it, of it. That's a pinhole photograph, so it's, it's soft, but that's, I like the sense of timelessness. That's why I photograph with a pinhole camera. And then on the right, again, it gives you a little sense about how, uh, I'll say dangerous. You know, they, they were called slave property in the day. And, um, and it's because they had a license, a bill of sale, just like we have uh, for a car. And so, so it was dangerous, uh, not only for, for, you know, quote, the slaves coming across, but for those that were harboring, and Edwin was one of them. Uh, next slide. By the, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, Edwin got into a, a, a confrontation with authorities in, in Burlington and uh, was arrested. You know, they, they uh, were accusing him of, of harboring uh, uh, slaves and, and uh, he, he wasn't going to tip his hand, but he got into a big confrontation, so he was arrested and uh, took him about two days to get that cleared up. Um, at this point, it's really important for all of his accomplishment, botanist, writer, geologist, explorer, for all that accomplishment, uh, he really faded from history. And he, this is the most important thing, he lost every battle that, that he attempted. You know, whether it was to save the bison, he wanted strict laws on that, the environment, Indians, you know, all those battles he essentially lost. And uh, so, so at the end, he became reclusive. You know, he kept to himself. Uh, people, he would come into town, you know, after a few weeks, they noted that he would dress in the same clothes and uh, didn't seem to take care of himself, didn't want to talk. Uh, some people reported that whatever was on Edwin's mind, uh, you would never know. He didn't have anything to share. He was short-tempered. And, uh, and here's one that's really important. He did not see himself as really contributing anything of value. So, uh, so he became very reclusive. And then uh, he died in, in October of 1861 when he fell off of a, a cart hauling lumber. And the tragedy of it is the one battle that he was going to actually win was the issue of slavery. And so uh, the Civil War was about six months into it when he died. He had no idea it was going to cost 650,000 lives to settle the issue, but he would have won that issue. He lost everything else, but he would have won on that issue. So it's kind of tragic. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna switch gears. I'm gonna blast through this as fast as I can. Uh, I hope Kara will keep me on, on track. Uh, give me the three minute warning uh, for the end part. Um, so I'm a photographer. I'm not so much a historian, but I'm a photographer. And I uh, take my photos with a pinhole camera. I don't know if anyone can see this, but this is my camera. A wooden box with uh, electrical tape uh, for a shutter. Exposures are very, very long, um, anywhere from several minutes to several hours. 
The one on the right was my original cardboard box pinhole. The one on the left is uh, the one I currently use, and, I, and I've been, it's very durable. I've been using that for about 12 years now. Um, on the right shows diagrams of how a pinhole goes. I would need uh, probably another 20 minutes to explain the science between pinholes, but it's really a miracle. So uh, it produces a, a soft image. I believe it's timeless. I, uh, my work is predicated on beauty. Um, one guy said everyone should have a portfolio of beauty in their lives. And I really strongly uh, believe that. And so that's how I see my photography. Front and center, I want, I want beauty and timelessness. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just shows the difference. On the left is a, a lensed picture. Uh, on the right is what a pinhole does with that. And you can see it's softer. You can also see this effect of foreshortening. Uh, it's a really weird effect. And it seems the closer you get, the further things go further. Or the closer you get, the further away they seem. Pinhole has unlimited depth of field. Your near and far are infinite. And so I, I can do pretty wild things with that. Uh, next photo. So here we go. What I did is I'm not following in Edwin's footsteps. I, I want to just simply record the land uh, as he might have seen it. You know, timeless, ethereal, sublime. Uh, I'm not so sure you can actually photograph sublimity, but I try. Uh, I used quotes for titles out of his account. So, uh, uh, so you'll see like the woodless plain. He's, you know, he talked about being out, out in nowhere there. Uh, so I'm going to go quick. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the chalk cliffs out in the Pawnee Buttes. This is again the same kind of landscape they would have traversed as they came west. Um, and you can see again the, the titles, their quotes. Uh, next slide. Um, they got to the, the South Platte. One of the orders from Long was to get to the headwaters of the Platte and determine uh, how, how well you could nav navigate. Edwin noted in the official account that uh, the Platte seemed to be about a mile wide and two feet deep. Uh, in other words, you weren't going to send a, 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 you know, a steamer or, or a boat down, uh, you know, carrying goods. It wasn't going to work. Uh, next slide. Another shot of the plat gives you a sense of uh, being wide and shallow. So uh, uh, next slide. This shot was actually amazing. I, I really uh, didn't think it was going to work. And uh, uh, the, the pinhole's very wide angle. And this particular day, I was kind of going, oh, it's just not going to work. But I decided to take one photo of Pikes Peak. And to my amazement, um, I, I loved what came out. It, it just shows the distance. And uh, um, the pinhole, you don't know what you're going to get because you can't look through the camera. It, you do it by uh, hand signals. You know, uh, it's 160 degrees uh, of angle of vision. So, uh, so you never know what you're going to get. This one was a beautiful uh, surprise for me. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows the steepness of the terrain. Uh, he talks about uh, being a little bit uh, nervous about falling down and, uh, and keeping his footholds. This is accurate. The tree on the right is vertical. And so, you know, the other trees are leaning heavily, but it's accurate. And I can vouch for that because I too was kind of scrambling around to make sure I didn't uh, make a false step. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is from Red Rock uh, Canyon. Again, he talks about being uh, thrown over uh, cliffs and, and whatnot. Uh, actually, the, the one on the left is actually from uh, next to the plat. And again, it's accurate. The tree is vertical. And uh, you can see it's quite steep to the left. Uh, the one on the, the right, uh, I like it because you, you can get a sense of the uh, rocks and the canyons uh, that were beyond uh, abysses. Next slide. Um, one of the things about a pinhole is I can uh, photograph directly into the sun. You don't have hexagons like with a lens. Um, and I love what it can do with uh, shadows and composition. Uh, again, Edwin talks about being in rough terrain. And, uh, and we got to remember, he has no map. He doesn't have anything going for him except dead reckoning. And uh, 
So, so I like this photo, you know, to me, it reveals again, some of the, the landscape he went through. Uh, next slide. This one is uh, a little smoother. This is up in the crags area. Uh, the pinhole, as you can see near and far, uh, the camera is literally on that pond of water. Um, but, but again, reveals uh, the, the terrain. Tree on the left is virtually vertical, so you get a sense of uh, the, the, how level it was. Um, next slide. Um, he talks about the, the rocky masses that, that show up in the mountains of Colorado. So, uh, so I wanted to, to get that effect. That is an absolutely huge rock. As I said, the closer you move into it, the further th things seem to go. So, uh, um, but that was, that was what I was trying to illustrate. Next uh, slide. Uh, again, I can photograph right into the sun. This is in the Elk Park area. Um, you know, this is an area that he likely traversed through. Uh, they have a, a thing nearby called the Obliterated Trail that's on topographic maps. A lot of people think that was uh, the path he took. Uh, and, and he also crossed what's now the Cog Railroad. So, so again, I just wanted to show the uh, general terrain. Uh, next slide. Um, pinholes are long exposures, so it's really cool how clouds move. You can't predict it, but uh, I just love, you know, this kind of thing. Um, movement's really important to a pinhole image because it wants to compress your uh, depth of field and tonality. Uh, next slide. And uh, now, now we're getting to the summit. This is the tundra. And my favorite place to photograph is up on the tundra. It's just uh, sublime means terrifying beauty. And, uh, and it really is when you're out in the middle of nowhere by yourself um, with such an expansive area um, and it's beautiful. It, it really can, uh, I don't know that's terrifying for me, but it's humbling. Uh, next slide. Um, talks again about, you know, the rough terrain and scrambling. So this is the boulder field on the east face of uh, Pikes. And, uh, you know, as you can see in the background, weather is an issue. Uh, Edwin and his companions had fair weather. Uh, he, he lucked out on that. Uh, next slide. Here we are at the summit. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure, well, I won't say I'm sure, but anyone who's been on the summit, it's very broad, very big. Uh, this was, Actually, a park ranger saved me on this. I, I had pegged this to be about a 40 minute exposure at the end of the day and the rangers told me to get off the mountain and I, I, I was stalling because I felt I needed another 20 minutes and she finally gave me an ultimatum so I cut the exposure short and she saved me. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would have been a shot that wouldn't have worked so well. Uh, next slide. And so then I descended down, uh, uh, they went south after Pikes Peak, they went south uh, to the Canadian River and, and south of that. They were a little twisted around, they didn't know uh, exactly where they were, but uh, uh, if you've ever been out to the Comanche uh, grasslands or south of there and, and heading east, it is a desert. You know, they, they were starving for water constantly and, and food. And uh, so I felt this really illustrated that. Um, and it's true, I, I roamed around there uh, backpacking for four days at one point, and I was, I was just thankful I even had water and food because I, I searched for three days just to find a body of water to photograph. So, uh, so I, I felt, you know, his, his uh, calling it the Great American Desert, I think he was right on. And uh, so uh, let's see, next slide, I'm not, Quite sure. Oh, okay. I'm going to jump to this in just a second. Uh, you know, when it came to the the Major Long expedition, you know, they decided the Platte River was too shallow. They decided it was a desert, not fit for agriculture. They decided that uh, it was only nomadic uh, Indians in the area. And there's one thing we have to really note. It's very important because they called it a desert, and that the Rocky Mountains formed a wall. Uh, as uh, time and migration started to take hold, the feeling was we'll, we'll give the Indian tribes the, the place that was the worst for trying to survive. 
and to literally push them up against the Rocky Mountains. And uh, that was a cruel thing to do. And Edwin was incensed about it. And, uh, but there was nothing he could do. Uh, history rolled right over him on that. But, um, but in the front range, that's what happened. He has that, that area, that long. And Edwin said you know, it was not fit for human habitation. Uh, unfortunately, the push of settlement and migration, and that's where they, they put you know, the trail of tears and everything. Uh, okay, so, so I'm almost done. I hope I have about two to three minutes left. I know I'm moving quick. Um, I was going to, I just casually said that I was going to just walk up to the summit of Pikes Peak uh, on the, the days that Edwin did. I wanted to do a three, three day round trip. And I just casually said, I want to do it, you know, just for my own purpose and uh, photography. And then uh, my cousin, uh, Douglas, who's the family historian, he was in connection with uh, tons of family members that I, I didn't know even exist. And it, in short order, I was inundated with emails and phone calls from people and relatives I had never known saying they want to join me on that hike. Um, we, we basically rented out the entire uh, bar camp. That was going to be the plan. Um, we had about uh, around 30 to 35 people that were going to hike and backpack uh, the trail with me. COVID came along, bar camps that were closing up, all reservations were canceled. We could camp out in the, uh, the forest across the uh, path. And that cost us, that meant we had to pack in a lot of extra equipment. Here, here's the, so we, our numbers got cut down to 16. And this was uh, the morning before uh, half of these people had a disaster. <laughs> so I'll, I'll briefly hit that. Uh, next slide. Hey, Mark, just to give you a heads up, we got about one more minute and then we want to get Kathy started. Okay, I'm going to move super fast. Uh, these are just some pictures of us up on the trail uh, on July 14th. Uh, next. There was real suffering, real suffering for the people who came out uh, to do this hike that had absolutely no idea or business being on there. And uh, this guy was Joel and boy, was he hurting. A lot of suffering for eight of the members. Uh, next slide. Eight of us uh, gained the summit uh, from the hiking party, and we were met by a ton of people, uh, related and friends, that drove to the top. And so, uh, so uh, you know, this was just a picture of some of the people. We had a banner. Um, let's see. Next slide. Uh, contact information. I did want to in 30 seconds say that four of us, myself included, were late getting off of the peak. We got caught in the worst storm in my entire history of backpacking. It was a nightmare. There was so much lightning. So it was a terrifying descent for, for four of us. And uh, Colorado Springs, from what I know, had a flash flood. Uh, Edwin escaped that. So we'll leave it at that. I'll conclude. Thank you very much, Mark. I will say this, the, the, your photography is amazing. Um, and, I, and I can't wait to see an exhibit at some point in the future because you could spend hours looking at all those images. Um, Thank you. I hope we have some good uh, questions at the end here. Um, and I do want to apologize to everyone for our late start. We are going to push a little bit past 1130 um, to make sure that we uh, cover all of the, the topics today. Um, so we will get Kathy going right now. Um, Catherine Scott Sturvent is a professor of history at Pikes Peak Community College. She has taught U.S. history there for almost three decades. She teaches Colorado Western, American Indian, and women's history, among other topics. Kathy works frequently with PPLD and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, on projects. She has also authored two books, many articles, and has won local, state, and national awards for teaching excellence. As a social historian, Kathy advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Kathy is a previous regional history symposium presenter and author, and as the person that kicked off the sesquicentennial uh, virtual symposiums, it just made a lot of sense to have you bookend and and shut her down. So I'd like to introduce Kathy Sturvant and 
the her presentation is the Quaker Trail Moral Infiltration, Disintegration, and Revival in the Pikes Peak region. Kathy, it's all yours. Thanks, Brett. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. Um, thanks, Brett. So I like being a bookend that fits well into my house. Um, a couple of things about the title here. I wanted to make sure that I reminded ourselves that this is actually a topic that would have been in the um, symposium that never was because of COVID. And so, and Chris would recall this. Um, and so the theme had to do with trails. There is not literally a Quaker trail across America, but my point is that there is sort of a, um, what do I want to say, a sort of philosophical uh, trail followed by Quakers, just like most cultural groups moved west in American history. Um, Quakers tended not to do it in large group migrations, not like the Mormons, for example, but did it in uh, patterns that are very easy to see in Colorado Springs, partly because of its founder brings that out. I also want to show if you can um, see me or put the camera on me, either way is going to work. This particular volume in the Pikes Peak Symposium series, the regional history series, the Legends, Labors, and Loves of William Jackson Palmer, I will refer to a number of times, per perhaps. So I want to remind you that that's still available. And also, you will hear me refer to topics that were in other symposia that will be published in the future. Next slide, please. This is a dense one, but I'll make it as fast as I can. Um, part of why I see a theme in a group of people who did not come here as a group, but as one by one individuals, um, but a theme of their being Quakers and bringing Quakerism to the area um, and having influence with it is because of the period that they're coming in. They're coming in the immediate pre and during and post Civil War era. And so an era when their beliefs are very strongly interwoven with what happens in the United States, with the moral issues of the day, and with westward expansion as one of those packages of moral issues. So you see a thread of Quakerism throughout our history at this time and coming in this direction that I really wasn't that aware of until I started to look closer and closer at the examples I'm going to give you. You need a little bit of explanation, and I will humbly try to explain some of the main beliefs of this religion. The inner or inward light, which is a, a sort of a way of referring to the soul, or what they might have said originally, that of God within thee, that every person has that of God within them. And that's why they can, for example, in a church service, communicate or privately communicate directly and silently with God without the intermediary of um, an administrative person like a minister. They also therefore see every human being as equal. That's going to affect all of the moral values that I refer to in connection with individuals. Obviously, General Palmer will be one of those, but there's a surprising number of them. Um, they are pacifists and so abhor any violence normally. Um, also tended to act with an awareness, a conscience, um, integrity and honesty, one would hope anyway, um, and charitable and kind acts, um, social justice minded, and they're associated with simplicity. And we'll see an example of that in Colorado Springs in a moment, um, but in clothing and appearance in lots of aspects of life, because that is humble and it displays a sense of equality. There are causes that we can see reflected in the history of our area. Um, include, obviously, religious tolerance of their own religion and others, um, very much abolitionists towards slavery, as we know General Palmer was. Uh, they are temperance advocates. It's been an interesting little controversy ever since we recently dug up some of General Palmer's trash 
to discuss, literally, to discuss whether he was truly someone who never imbibed alcohol and that he was not. Um, but a temperance advocate, and remember that the temperance movement, the movement to prohibit um, alcohol to one degree or another, had a lot to do with preventing abuse, spousal abuse, abuse of children, um, abandonment of families, the kinds of things that alcoholism could bring. So the women's rights movement and the anti-slavery movement were almost inextricably bound together with the temperance movement. And most of these Quaker individuals are acutely aware of women's equality compared to other groups of their day. They do see women as equal. Prison reform was important to them, helping people in dire straits, primarily. Uh, Native American Indian rights and education. And I wanna mention because of all the controversy today about boarding schools, that although their interest in educating Native American children did include Quaker boarding schools, um, and there were um, unfortunate, at least, aspects of some of those schools, as there are of any of the Native American boarding schools. The Friends organizations have been very fast to condemn their own practice of having done that in many cases. So watching all of these ideas, we will keep in mind, next slide please, the influence of Quakerism in this area. I wanted you to see this particular picture for several reasons. This is an example of the earliest Quakers um, speaking. And it was remarkable, it was revolutionary, it was offensive even for a woman to do public speaking, but Quakers allowed us how they didn't have a minister running things, but they did have a minister in the sense that anyone who could speak inspirationally and well might stand up in a Quaker meeting and do that. And women loved doing that. The reason she has this costume is important to connect with all sorts of trends in our culture. It looks a little witchy, but it's actually the national costume of Wales. And Wales is the source of many of the Quakers who came to America and who came all the way out here. Genealogy is going to enter into what I share with you today about individual Quakers who came to our area and did remarkable social justice things or had remarkable ideas. Many of them have this Welsh Quaker background and I've traced the genealogy of the key ones I'm going to talk about to having not only um, a common thread of Welsh or at least English Quaker immigrant background, but even all being related to each other one way or another. So it's an interesting phenomenon, how much being Welsh and how much women's voices have to do with all of this. Next slide, please. One more, um, in this case, very peculiar image of Quakers I wanted to share with you so that you understand another aspect of this. I'm going to introduce someone that we don't think of as a peaceful and loving Quaker. Um, this is a literary image created by an author named Robert Byrd, and his novel was called Nick of the Woods. The idea was if Quakers are as peaceful and wonderful as they're portrayed or claimed to be, then they must have a devil inside of them, or there must be a Quaker run amok. And that's what Nick of the Woods is supposed to be. It also, by the way, to go back to the reference we had earlier of James Fenimore Cooper and his novels, this also was an anti-Cooper approach to saying both Native Americans and Quakers could be violent and evil out there on the frontier. Keep that in mind. Next slide, please. One of my favorite little Quaker history aspects of Colorado Springs is Quaker rocks in Garden of the Gods or Monument Park, as it was known. And you can see, if you look at the shape of hats of Quaker men, um, how these rocks might have struck someone as some Quakers maybe lined up for meeting, to go to meeting. 
it's an amusing thought. It also just reminds us that Quakers were in the minds of early settlers of Colorado Springs. They were familiar people. Next slide, please. One of the first individuals I'm using as an example of this study that seems to bring out um, so many trends of a population movement is William Gilpin, the first territorial governor of Colorado, strong Quaker background. And if you're wondering if the photographer Laura Gilpin was related to him, yes, her father and he were cousins. Um, he came from a qua classic, qua say that fast, a classic Quaker family uh, of Welsh and Southwest England background. All of these families settled in the area of Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. A few started or moved to Virginia, North Carolina, and later moved into places like Indiana and Ohio to avoid the intensification of slavery in the Southern areas. But the patterns are very consistent. Um, they tend to follow the same tier of movement across. So William Gilpin became a Western explorer and military officer, but also the first territorial governor and a great booster of the West, all with his Quaker background in his mind. Next slide, please. I tried to think of which of all the different Quakers I could mention might fit the nick of the woods characterization, and I'm not really sure I'm maybe taking too big a leap here, but John Evans, Evans being a very Welsh name is a clue, John Evans, the second territorial governor of Colorado, was from an old Quaker family that followed all of the patterns I've already said about where they're from originally, and where they immigrated to, and he grew up a Quaker, and he was in his 20s when he converted by choice to a different religion, Methodism, and from that point on, identified away from Quakerism. But it's still very interesting to realize that he was another one who came out here with these roots. We have talked a lot, so you've probably heard and read and seen a lot about uh, the Sand Creek Massacre. But it's, in my opinion, one of the most heinous events in Colorado history. And it does have a symbolic uh, comparison potential with the Nick of the Woods story, although, of course, Governor Evans was not one of the participants directly at Sand Creek, but more and more we do see him as a planner. So one of the things that uh, to think about, and yes, I will mention military, thank you, in connection with um, pacifism, but one of the things that we can think about with John Evans is now that our governor today has actually rescinded his proclamations that led to the Sand Creek Massacre, it brings to light even more thoughtful analysis of John Evans. And I do think that we might find an interesting pattern um, of a, a sort of a version or reversion uh, from Quaker pacifism to a more aggressive approach to settlement in the West. And next slide, please. And here is WJP, William Jackson Palmer, all the things we know and talk about him, uh, we know in particular in relation to his Quakerism that he was an abolitionist against slavery, more passionately perhaps than any of his other issues. He was all of the things listed here. Here you have a picture of him as a young man with his parents, John and Matilda. Their family history as Quakers goes back in the same patterns I've been mentioning, Welsh and English, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, a long, long line of, of Quaker ancestors. And one of the places you'll find the best representation of Palmer's Quakerism is da, 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 in the book I was recommending by my friend and colleague Leah Witherow. He was so passionate an abolitionist that he, first of all, with a friend of his, Isaac Clothier, ran an abolitionist conference um, to bring people to hear speakers, which was a very unusual thing for young men to do, not particularly for Quakers to do, but 
to take risks because there were threats from pro-slavery people. It was a risky thing to do. And his passion to abolish slavery took him to the point of desperately sorting out in his own mind the right or wrong of taking up arms to fight slavery. There are so many people who fought in the Civil War for the Union and lost track of or weren't even in it in the first place necessarily to fight slavery. There's nobody who was more intensely in it as an abolitionist to fight slavery than William Jackson Palmer. He fought verbally and intellectually with his parents, his family, and his friends meeting who did not understand compromising the principles of pacifism to even be in the military, let alone to want to be a violent crusader about anything. So it was a major turning point in his life. It doesn't mean that he abandoned everything he'd grown up with about Quakerism, of course not, but it does mean he was frustrated with them one way and another for the rest of his life. Next slide, please. I'm saying next slide, please, too fast. This slide, Brett referred to my um, beginning the sesquicentennial piece with um, his role. And KPRR, Janet, is Kansas Pacific Railroad. Um, Brett referred to my doing that. Most of what's in this little outline on the left was also in that first slide I used talking about Palmer as the founder. Um, I won't go over all of that in, in grand detail, except to say you can see what an aggressive and energetic and intellectual uh, person he was about how to found a community. Working your way down that list on the left, go to the bottom one. Um, a for abolitionist is what he was, I think because he was a Quaker, more than any other passionate cause perhaps in his whole life. You could maybe say his passion for railroads is comparable, but it's not the same kind of passion. However, there's another A, A for anti-imperialist, I wanted to remind ourselves of. And again, in, that, uh, in the books that we've produced out of the Pikes Peak Library District uh, Regional History Series, you will find material on his anti-imperialism, but there's even more to be said. Um, he was one of the leading members founding an organization called the Anti-Imperialist League, a national organization of very prominent individuals across America who were opposed to the Spanish-American War. This is really remarkable because it's, it's based on Quaker pacifism, among other things, but it's also based on a realization that American white Protestant uh, American culture and politics and government and military moving into the Philippines or Cuba was wrong. For a man who's done what William Jackson Palmer has done to take that position is rather startling until or unless you look at these roots of his beliefs. And the anti-imperialists were many of the greatest progressive reformers of the early 1900s and late 1800s. Their papers are kept at Swarthmore College, um, the Quaker University. And next slide, please. And thanks to Eric Metzger um, of McAllister House Museum, um, who made the point to me that he saw Henry McAllister, who's the executive director of the Colorado Springs Company at the behest of his comrade in arms officer and Quaker friend, Palmer, that Henry McAllister was able to be sort of a, um, what do I want to say, foil maybe for General Palmer to represent Quaker values and ideas, stricter values and ideas about setting up the Colorado Springs Company and Fountain Colony, more so than General Palmer chose to do outwardly and actively. So we see McAllister as maybe a, a mirror image 
uh, through a different filter. And McAllister, who had the same background again as General Palmer and the other Quakers I'm referring to, openly practiced his Quakerism and, and talked about it. He was the one who openly enforced the temperance prohibition uh, on deeds in the properties in the colony. He is the one who, when he knows General Palmer wants a college in the colony, persuades Colorado College in a lot of co communications with them. He, he and his wife were not practicing as much as they might have been in Pennsylvania. However, they're continuing throughout their stay here to donate funds to Swarthmore and to send children to Swarthmore. When Lucretia Mott died, Lucretia Mott had been uh, two Quakers and to the women's rights movement, uh, the great heroine, and she, her death was deeply, deeply mourned by the McAllister family. Next slide, please. And here's one you might not have thought of, but if you get used to doing some of the investigating into Quakers and Quaker families and Quaker genealogy in America, you find the name Sharpless is a very old, large-scale Quaker family name. And so William Sharpless Jackson, who was for General Palmer, a director of his Denver and Rio Grande Railway, uh, was definitely of all the same Quaker background as the people I've isolated here. Um, they are all distantly related to each other. I mean, as in a genealogical way. And he is the man that Helen Hunt Jackson came here and suddenly liked the place when she fell in love and got married. Um, he has those classic roots. He wanted a Quaker wedding service, which is a very specific, simplistic kind of wedding service. And it's interesting because I attribute some of her discovery of Indian rights as her passionate cause, not just to the famous moment when she heard a lecture by Chief Standing Bear, but that Helen Hunt Jackson became an Indian rights advocate, partly because she was always ripe for a passion and just hadn't found it yet, partly because she lived in Colorado Springs and traveled back and forth, a railroad tycoon or director's wife can do that, and had learned to um, be questioning of her neighbors and associates in Colorado Springs, some of whom had participated in the Sand Creek Massacre. She's the first woman, first person there is really, since the investigations into what happened at Sand Creek that happened right after it. She's the first person to challenge Colorado white population and this incident that had happened. And she goes with a vengeance onto all of her Indian rights reform, her husband encouraging her. If you read the correspondence for that time, it's a rather remarkable marriage to see how he accepts her distance and encourages her and answers her questions. Um, so I think that he knew what it was like to know a woman like that, even though Helen Hunt Jackson was not initially a Quaker. And next. Some of you may remember this, I know Chris will, from another symposium. This advertisement was placed in 1955 in Colorado Springs newspaper to represent SANE, which is a statement for Americans in a nuclear age. These folks all signed on to concern about nuclear war, nuclear energy, um, what all of this might mean to the entire future of the earth. And as people took that position, it not only made a few more Quakers out of people who weren't Quakers, but it brought out the Quaker in a lot of people. One of the leaders of this movement in the 1950s in Colorado Springs was Professor Carlton Gamer, who has been absolutely wonderful to interview and learn from. Um, he was a leader at Colorado College. He became, he started Quaker meetings with others who became Quakers. He had come out of being um, a protester, an anti-war protester in other places. 
Um, he also helped be behind the American Friends Service Committee, which is what AFSC stands for. And today would say that one organization that he believes in is the Pikes Peak Peace and Justice Commission, which is quite representative of what Quaker organizations would have been like at earlier times. So there are themes I need to investigate more to see how much I can trace this trend in Colorado Springs across more modern times, but it's there. And next, please. And then there was just recently, um, after obviously the death of George Floyd, uh, some Black Lives Matter protests in Colorado Springs. And I remember I called or texted my friend Leah when I said, they're protesting in front of the museum. And protests did occur and there was some, what could be considered violence, but generally speaking, not much or not much damage, uh, so much as having a voice. I know a lot of people who took part in those and they wanted to have a voice. They wanted to make statements. Leah was interviewed by several people because of her master's thesis and her being the um, curator at the Pioneers Museum, so aware of General Palmer. And so I was sharing my ideas with her and vice versa during that period. When Palmer still thought all his life, it bothered him that his Quaker meeting where his parents attended had um, questioned his motives or his actions in joining the military and becoming ultimately a Brigadier General and a Congressional Medal of uh, Honor Award winner and so on, he would say, I find that I should have done great violence to my convictions of right and duty had I remained at home. I do not understand that friends, capital F meaning Quakers, desire me to think or say that I regretted the course I took under these circumstances. So when asked about it, Leah said, it's an incredible example of someone who doesn't just talk. He walks the talk. He stood by his principles and his convictions and he went to war for them. It makes me proud. Well, that came up when she was asked about the protests in Colorado Springs. And I was asked about them too. And my students and I were talking about them. And the one thing Yes, KPRR is Kansas Pacific Railroad. <laughs> that was the one that General Palmer was supervising the construction on that brought him to Colorado Springs. Ultimately brought him to the place that he would found Colorado Springs. But when I saw what the damage was for General Palmer um, in the Black Lives Matter protests in Colorado Springs, and on top of all the layers we know of uh, feeling that gets expressed about the position of his statue, which I am sworn as much as uh, anyone can be um, to protect and defend by the woman who wrote the history book on the statue. Um, that, that damage, when I looked at it, I thought, well, yeah, okay, Black Lives Matter. If you said to William Jackson Palmer, Black Lives Matter, he would say, of course they do. And he would be probably too modest to say, enough that I was willing to give up my life for them. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Kathy. That was uh, a very, uh... Great way to end this symposium uh, for the sesquicentennial year with something that occurred last year, but bridging all the way back to the founding. Um, fantastic. I'd like to invite everyone, uh, all of our presenters to turn off their cameras and unmute. Uh, we will do a quick Q and A. Um, we've got some questions in the Q and A function um, and some came through in the chat. Um, so I'll sort of go through those. Um, if there are any other 
questions, please feel free to throw those into that Q&A function and we'll make sure to hit on them. Uh, the first question that I believe I saw, let me see here. Uh, Rick, there was a question about the photo observation platform on Cheyenne Mountain. Um, and uh, you've already answered that in the Q&A function that you're going to do a little bit more research. Um, so we don't have to, to dive into that one, easy enough. Uh, next question was for Mark. Um, did Edwin James have any Indian guides on his uh, expedition? Um, not that I know of in a proper sense. Um, he, he documents actually very, very closely and very much the interactions they had. Um, when they started out, uh, I forget which uh, Indian tribe, they were laughing at him saying that they would surely die uh, in their attempt to traverse the area. And, uh, um, but he did have a lot of interaction. He did gain a lot of knowledge and information about what was going on, what they were traveling through. Um, I should know, and I'll do it really quick. Um, towards the end of their uh, uh, expedition, they ran into a, a guy that had been uh, essentially an Indian agent. He, he was not properly called that, but, but uh, the guy to told, uh, witnessing a treaty signing that was going on. He related this to Edwin, and he made the important statement that he said that, that at that signing, they declared that if the Indians didn't sign the paper, then they were going to be considered enemies of the United States. If they did sign it, they'd be friends of the United States. And the observation was that, that the Indians had absolutely no idea what they were signing. They did not understand it, and they had no idea what, what they were involved in. That's something right there. Um, a follow-up question as well. Um, did Edwin go on any other uh, expeditions? He wanted to. He was stationed at a fort, and uh, uh, but he was late. He was late. Uh, he knew the uh, Long was going to do another expedition. He wanted to join him, but uh, they miscommunicated, and uh, Edwin did not arrive in time to join that expedition. Got it. Thank you, uh, Kathy. A couple questions for you. Uh, I think the first one that we came that we had received was if you could comment on the paradox of Quaker pacifism uh, with that military uh, service. I think you've sort of hit on this, but I wanted to throw it out to you um, more specifically. It it I think the two wars that I see it the most are the Civil War and World War II where Quakers who historically would have been anti-war because of their pacifism um, also saw something so uh, inhumane or heinous happening that that might take precedence. Um, uh, my father, for example, um, was someone who would, never would have thought of being in a war and um, and I know lots of Quakers thought this way when they saw what was happening or learned even a small portion mm -hmm. of it, they joined. In Palmer's case, I've made it clear with his example, um, there were not a lot of Quakers who fought, but it's interesting when you start to look for Quakers in the Civil War among um, book sites like say just Amazon, I found many, many books who thought they were, each author thought they were doing the unique theme of this is very unusual that there's a Quaker fighting in the Civil War. And so they started to accumulate and they were the same. There was, there was a cause that seemed to outweigh the pacifism. Perfect. Um, the next question we had for you, Kathy, was, and this may be a tougher one to do, um, because it's a, a specifically about the painting of the Quaker meeting that you had in your PowerPoint. Um, and I can't recall the, the photo or the, the image um, without uh, Yeah, I would have to see it myself again because Eric's making a good point that there's something interesting down, oh, there, okay. The dog appears, the yes, the dog appears to perhaps be peeing on the bench, I think. <laughs> Good eye, Eric. Yeah, um, I had never even noticed there was a dog there, Eric. So that's that's a really interesting thought. Um, 
I don't know. I'll research. But my first thought is between that and the representation of the woman speaking, this per, this artist might have been mocking the Quakers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will have to look at that and see. I don't know, but I, I appreciate it because it probably has deep meaning. Yeah, this, is Rick, this is Rick. I, I, I agree. I, I agree with Kathy. I think that's what's going on there. I think the, the artist was trying to send a maybe not so subtle message. Yes. Thank you, Perfect. Eric. <laughs> yeah, good eye, yeah, Eric. I definitely give you credit for that one. Uh, we've got another question that I think just popped up. Uh, no more of a statement. I have a Welsh collector doll, and she has that same hat as the woman um, is wearing there. Um, on that note, I want to say thank you very much to our presenters. Um, we had an excellent slate today, and I want to thank everyone that's been uh, participating and sticking around with us throughout all four of these uh, virtual sessions. Uh, it's definitely not what we're used to. Um, we've done 18 of these. Uh, last year was canceled and then this year went virtual. So this is definitely not what we, what we want or what we expect. Um, but I want to say thank you to all those participants. If you can make it, come on out on uh, September, uh, I think it's 26th. I'm looking at my notes right now. I apologize. Uh, September 25th. Uh, to that uh, symposium uh, social. Uh, that's where we can actually get together and see each other. Uh, this has been uh, a little different. So we hope that this is able to, to, to sort of bridge us into the next year. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you very much to the presenters and thank you very much to everyone that had, uh, that had come here. Uh, you could be anywhere in the world today and you decided to be here with us. So thank you very much. On that note, uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you.